Did you know that on a handful of rare occasions, ghosts have actually influenced legal cases? And what if I told you that they hadn't just influenced cases, but actually provided critical evidence that would sway the opinion of the court? While there exist several notable examples in the historical record, West Virginia's Greenbrier ghost is probably the most famous. We're gonna look at two lesser known prominent cases, the Terrace seat of Bossa murder and the Chaffin Will case. Now on the evening of February 21st, 1977, firefighters in Chicago, Illinois would be called out to a high rise apartment in flames. They discovered an apartment 15B, the corpse of a woman underneath a mattress. However, she had not died from the fire nor from smoke inhalation. A knife had protruded from her very chest. And this was 48 year old Teresita Bassa, a Filipino immigrant and respiratory physical therapist employed at Chicago's own Edgewater Hospital. Now, immediately, law enforcement began investigating her homicide. Despite the state of her apartment building, they were able to reconstruct a believable series of events leading up to her murder she had on the telephone when someone arrived at the door. An intruder wrapped his arm around Teresita's neck until she had lost consciousness, then ransacked all her money and possessions. Next, he would strip her naked, took a butcher knife from the kitchen, and would plunge it into her chest. Now to hide the evidence, he would light the mattress on fire, piled it on top of her body, and then he fled. Law enforcement had a clear case of homicide on their hands, but they had trouble pinpointing suspects until Teresita herself reached out from beyond the grave. One of Teresita's co-workers at Edgewater Hospital was Remy Chua. Like Teresita, she too was Filipino, but the two only barely knew each other. And at some point, Remy declared, if there's no solution to her murder, Teresita can come to me in a dream. Now, to Remy's surprise, this is exactly what happened. While napping in the hospital locker room around two in the morning, Remy saw Teresita standing in front of her, completely solid, physically manifested as if she were still alive. She then vanished. Remy was terrified. After that, a strangeness fell over Remy. Her coworkers noticed that she had taken on Teresita's mannerisms and even started to look more like her murdered acquaintance. Now, Remy's husband, a Dr. Jose Chua, found his normally chipper wife, sullen and moody. It seems as if in her life, Teresita was also prone to stretches of bad moods. There were other hints that something strange was going on. According to Remy, in late July, she found herself inexplicably panicked when Alan Showery, male orderly at Edgewater, appeared behind her. And it dawned on Remy that that Showery was standing in a position similar to how Teresita's attacker would have approached. She said that her heart began racing. The irrational fear was so intense that Remy took time off of work. Now, according to her husband, Jose, Remy began speaking in her sleep, repeating, ow, 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 ow. She began dreaming of smoky rooms. The following day, she was so ill that she took a sedative and asked her parents to come watch over her. Strange behaviors, right? Well, it gets even weirder. To their surprise, Remy began rambling on in Spanish, a language they claimed Remy did not know. At last, Jose came to her side and asked, how are you? Remy then said this, I am Teresita Boss. Jose followed up by asking what Teresita wanted. I want help, she replied through Remy. Nothing has been done about the man who killed me. This strange possession only lasted a few moments. And two days later, Remy felt an intense pain in her chest, followed by the sensation of someone stepping into her body. Remy announced to her mother that Teresita had returned. When Jose got back from work, he again had a conversation with the dead woman through his wife. Did you talk to the police? She had asked him. Jose said he had not because he needed proof. Remy then announced, Alan killed me. I let Al into the apartment and he killed me. It was a startling revelation 
implicating Alan Showery, the orderly who had just frightened Remy a few days prior. Jose took this information to his superiors, who surprisingly treated the topic very seriously. They knew law enforcement might feel differently, you know, given the whole phantom situation, and advised Remy's husband to send an anonymous tip to the police. Other details began emerging from Teresita via Remy. She claimed that Alan had stolen her jewelry and given it to his girlfriend with whom he lived. She said that this evidence could be confirmed by Teresita's cousins and friends whose names she specifically provided. She explained that, Al came to fix my television and he killed me and burned me, tell the police. Luckily, the officer assigned to the case, a Joseph Stickula, was incredibly open-minded. He followed up on Alan Showery's record and discovered a history of criminal activity, including two sexual assaults, both of which had occurred in Teresita's apartment complex. Come on, guys, the dude is guilty. He also lived only four blocks from the victim. When interrogated in early August of 1977, Alan admitted that Teresita had asked him to repair her TV just like the Phantom Teresita had told Remy, but said he forgot and went to the bar instead. Had he ever been to her apartment, they asked? No, he assured them. When asked if he was confident enough to allow his fingerprints to be compared from some lifted at the crime scene, Alan quickly changed his tune and then began claiming, Oh yeah, come to think of it, I actually did visit Teresita's place several months earlier, and this changed yet again to the evening of her murder, where he said he had visited but lacked the parts to repair the TV. Now the final nail in Alan's coffin came when police asked his girlfriend about some new jewelry given to her the night of Teresita's death. Alan claimed they came from a pawn shop, but Teresita's friends and cousins easily identified all the items as belonging to Teresita, just as Remy Chua said they would. Now, shortly thereafter, the detectives actually heard Alan Showery, still in custody, admit to his girlfriend that he had indeed murdered Teresita Bassa. His motivation was to rob her, and as he had money trouble, unluckily for him, Teresita only had 30 bucks in her purse. I hope murder was worth it for 30 bucks. So he stayed her body to look like a sexual assault, then lit the mattress on fire and fled. A trial was held on January 21st, 1979. Frustratingly, the involvement of Remy Chua led to a mistrial. The jury simply couldn't believe such a fantastic story of the supernatural. But justice was eventually served. Just over one month later, Alan Showery formally confessed to the murder of Teresita, and he was then sentenced to 14 years for murder and four years each on arson and armed robbery charges. The Teresita Bassa case is fascinating. It seems like one of the stronger cases for the perseverance of life after death. Remy Chua provided so many details that make this very clear. Now, perhaps the aspect of the story most often criticized is the insistence that Remy didn't know Spanish. This seems a bit hard to believe as she was part of the Filipino community. In fact, the Philippines have the highest concentration of Spanish speakers in Asia. However, only half a percent of the nation speaks Spanish, so who knows? Maybe she was indeed channeling the spirit of a dead co-worker. While the Teresita boss murder involved something resembling possession, the Chaffin Will case saw spirits communicating through dreams. On September 7th, 1921, a James L. Chaffin, a farmer from Moxville, North Carolina, died from injuries sustained during a fall. He left behind a wife, Susie, and four young sons. Now, according to a will that James complied in November of 1905, all of James's assets, including the farm, passed along to his eldest son, Marshall. Even though the arrangement didn't seem entirely fair, no one complained as the will was pretty clear. However, Marshall succumbed to heart issues about a year later. James's possessions passed on from Marshall to Susie. Still, no one complained, but that didn't mean that they were happy. One of the other sons, nicknamed Pink, always found himself poorer than his siblings, constantly stretching his finances to the breaking point. And to add to this stress, 
shockingly vivid visions of his father began popping up in Pink's dream in the summer of 1925. Each time, his father appeared incredibly sad and silent. The dreams culminated in late June, and Pink saw James dressed in a long black overcoat, his favorite when he had been alive. Pink's father opened the coat wide, showing off its interior. At last, James Chaffin's ghost spoke. You will find my will in my overcoat pocket. Poof, then he vanished. Now, Pink wasn't sure if he had been asleep or awake. The dream was just too lifelike. When he shared the vision with his own wife, the encouraged Pink to visit the home of his brother John, who only lived 20 miles away. It was the last place that Pink remembered seeing his father's overcoat. So Pink arrived at John's house, and after searching through the attic, he indeed found James's Chaffin's overcoat. And to his surprise, one of the inside pockets had been sewn shut. So after ripping the stitches out, Pink found a small rolled up note inside secured with a bit of string and written across in paper in his father's handwriting were the words, never eat at Sbarro. I, I'm just kidding. Read the 27th chapter of Genesis in my old daddy's Bible. At this point, Pink knew that he needed someone else to serve as a witness. He enlisted the help of a neighbor, Thomas Blackwelder, to fulfill this purpose. And together they turned the entire house upside down, searching for the old family Bible. At last, they found it hiding in the drawer of a bureau. When they flipped to Genesis 27, they were surprised to find the thin pages arranged into a sort of pocket, and tucked inside was a document, and there was no doubt that it was in James's Chaffin's handwriting. The two men learned that Pink's father had read Genesis 27 two years before he died, and the story of Isaac cheating Esau led James Chaffin to a change of heart. He amended his will will, but told no one and stuffed it in the Bible. This new document was drastically different. It stipulated only that James be given a decent burial and then his children take care of their mother's financial needs after his death. Now, this second will also clearly indicated James's wishes to have all of his property equally divided among his sons upon his passing. And by the fall of 1925, this new will had been filed in court and offered for probate. One one week before the trial commenced, Pink saw his father one final time. The ghost appeared agitated and demanded, where is my old will? Pink took this as a sign that the will would be found legally binding and hold up to scrutiny. The media eventually got wind of the case's supernatural elements and clamored for Pink to make a comment, deciding that testimony from the afterlife might not exactly help his case. Pink decided to take a more traditional route. He summoned 10 of his father's acquaintances and asked each of them to identify James Chaffin's handwriting. All it agreed, it was legitimate. Even though Pink's mother, Susie, and his brother's widow disputed this claim at first, they eventually admitted that the new will matched James's handwriting to a T, virtually proving this was not counterfeit. According to North Carolina law in this period of time, the will was deemed valid, even though no one had been there to witness its signing. The Chaffin family agreed to settle, and the property property was distributed evenly. Now, interestingly, the Chaffin Will case resembles an earlier incident that unfolded in Ionia, Iowa, in 1891. Late paranormal investigator and author Rosemary Ellen Guiley drew striking comparisons to the death of Michael Conley, who, like James Chaffin, was also a farmer. When news of Michael's death reached his daughter, she collapsed to the floor in a faint. Once she was revived, she would tell bystanders that she had seen her father dressed in his own burial suit, and she described it in excruciatingly vivid detail, even down to a pair of satin slippers of a new fashion that she couldn't have any existing knowledge of. To top it all off, Michael's daughter revealed that her father had sewn a large sum of money in the shirt he was wearing when he had died. Although these clothes had been tossed out when he passed away, the daughter's testimony was compelling enough that Michael's family retrieved the shirt. They examined the garment 
and to their surprise, found that a pocket was indeed sewn shut and contained $35, which in 1891 was a heck of a lot of money. Now, returning to the Chaffin Will case, what really happened? The years since have seen a variety of explanations offered. The most obvious is that Pink forged his father's new will, but it is unclear why he would have waited four years to enact that plan. Even if he had, why include the fantastic detail of the ghost or brother with embarking on a scavenger hunt to find it. Other dismissals that the Chaffin family somehow knew about the second will doesn't really make a lot of sense for similar reasons. Even if we assume that the supernatural was at play, it doesn't necessarily mean that a ghost was involved. Some have proposed that Pink learned about his father's will clairvoyantly. It's such a fantastic idea when all is said and done, we might as well take him at his word. That his father's ghost, like the slain spirit of Teresita Bassa, over 50 years later, reached out from beyond the grave to see the completion of his final wishes. But more importantly, I want to know what you guys think. So be sure to let me know what you think down in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. And if you guys enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button for more storytelling of the mysterious and supernatural. As always, guys, keep an open mind. I love you all, and I will see you guys in the very next episode.